My name is Cody, and I'm an engineer on the Go Cloud Client Libraries team here at Google. Today, I'm here to talk to you about some of the new and upcoming security features in Go, and how you can take advantage of them to write more secure applications. But let's take a step back for a minute and ask the question, why choose Go to begin with? Well, depending on your circumstances, you may choose Go for its performance characteristics, or maybe you want to choose Go for its easy readability. Others may be into the scalability aspects that Go can bring to their programs with its lightweight Go routine model. But today, I want to focus on the security that using Go can help bring to your applications. When we say security, we generally mean one of two things. The first is detecting and remediating known vulnerabilities in your dependencies. Let's take a look at an example of this. Let's say you are writing an application. One of the first things you probably need to do is pull in a couple of dependencies which provide some functionality to your code. This is illustrated as dependency packages B through H in the picture. But guess what? Your dependencies may also have dependencies, and they may actually depend on one another. And believe it or not, those dependencies have dependencies. Now what happens if a vulnerability occurs in one of these leaf node dependencies? Even though your code doesn't directly depend on this code, it may have consequences for your application. That is because the problem isn't isolated to only dependency K. It affects everything that depends on K. And so on, and so on, until boom. It's directly affecting your application. Dependency graphs can get complicated pretty quickly, which leaves a lot of places bad actors can stuff vulnerabilities that may affect large parts of the whole ecosystem. This is just a very simplistic view into what a dependency graph could look like. But in actuality, a lot of dependency graphs are much more complicated. So although you might think your dependency graph looks something like this, it may actually end up looking something like this. Okay, so maybe not exactly this bad since this is Kubernetes, but I think you get the picture. With Go, we are trying to solve this problem by addressing it for the entire ecosystem. With the help of Go's new vulnerability management system, which is now in preview, you can check your entire dependency graph against a curated database of vulnerabilities and fixes. This system takes information from existing data sources and curates it into a vulnerability database. Then this information is shared to different tools and integrations around the ecosystem. Let's take a deeper dive into this. All of this vulnerability data comes from existing well-known sources like CVEs or GHSAs, as well as from direct reports from Go package maintainers. This information is then vetted and reviewed by Go's security team and added to the Go vulnerability database. If you would like to read these vulnerabilities programmatically, you now can with the Go VulnDB client, which allows you to interact with the vulnerability database. The database may also be viewed directly in your browser via the Go package site, package.go.dev slash vuln. Additionally, there is also a vuln check API, which tools like the VS Code Go plugin will soon use to provide vulnerability detection and remediation directly in your IDE. Last but not least, we provide the Go vuln check command, which is a low noise, reliable way to find vulnerabilities from the command line. Unlike other solutions that might warn you of every vulnerability throughout your dependency graph, even if they don't affect you, Go VulnCheck analyzes your code base and surfaces vulnerabilities that actually affect your code. Vulnerability management helps detect and fix known vulnerabilities, but what about the unknown vulnerabilities, like the ones that may exist in the code that you have written? This is where Go's new fuzzing feature comes into play. Fuzzing is the process of testing your application using automatically generated inputs derived from coverage guidance and other signals. It is well suited for testing those hard to reach edge cases, which developers often miss. This makes fuzzing particularly valuable for finding security exploits and vulnerabilities. Go supports fuzzing in the standard toolchain beginning with Go 1.18. This makes Go the first major language to support it natively. Here is an example of what fuzzing looks like in Go. First, a fuzz test must be named with a function that starts with fuzz and accepts a testing.f as an input. The fuzz test contains a fuzz target, which is a call to f.fuzz, 
and takes a testing t as the first parameter, followed by fuzzing arguments. There must be exactly one fuzz target per fuzz test, and all seed corpus entries must have types which are identical to the fuzzing arguments. I know that was a lot of information really fast. So let's break it down by jumping into a demo. Today, we will be working with this dividing HTTP service. Our service takes a JSON request body and returns a JSON response or an error. As you can see, our code unmarshals some JSON, it computes a result, and then it marshals the result back to the calling client. Let's start by generating a unit test for this function. Let's refactor this test a little bit to take a JSON input and also a JSON result. So we can get rid of these args. We will rename this to input and result. This will be a string and cool. We can make use of the HTTP test package to create a fake response writer and a request. So let's just do that here. We'll say w is equal to HTTP test dot new recorder. And our request will be equal to an HTTP test dot new request. We'll say this is a post. Just call localhost 8080. And we need a body, so we'll do a strings.newReader, and we'll pass it in our input. Now let's pass in this input to our handler. So this is just going to be w, and this is going to be request. And it looks like we need to change this name as well. We'll just use input here as our test name. Awesome. Next in our test, we will want to verify the result of our calling function matches our test case's result. So let's do that. We will say if got is equal to, we'll trim this a little bit. Body string, we'll say if got does not equal want, and we'll just fail. This is tt.results. Cool. Now let's add a couple of test cases. First, let's compute 4 divided by 2, which should equal 2. So we need an input. Uh, this is going to be JSON. That's what our API accepts. We'll say 4, and y will be 2. And the result will also be JSON. And this should be two. And let's copy and paste this and add one more. Six divided by two. And that should equal three. Now let's give it a run and make sure everything passes. Oops, it looks like a white space difference. Let's try that once more. Great, everything passes. We're done, right? Well, maybe we could be, but I bet there are some cases that aren't being covered by these couple of tests. Let's see if we convert this test into a fuzz test to take advantage of the fuzzing engine to find out if there are any bugs in our code. The first step in changing this into a fuzz test is to rename the function. Just as there is a convention to name unit tests starting with the word test, fuzz tests need to start with the word fuzz, and they also take a different input parameter. They take a testing.f. So we'll rename this to fuzz, switch this to an f, and a testing.f. Now that we have a fuzz test, we need to write a fuzz target and also see it in our existing test cases. To register our test cases with the fuzzing target, we can use f.add to seed in our input also known as a corpus entry. 
Let's loop over our test cases and add each one. We'll copy this loop. And we want tt.inputs. Note that we are only passing our input value in as the corpus entry. Next, we need to update our t.run into a f.fuzz to register our fuzzing target. We can get rid of this loop. This will be an f.fuzz. As we can see, this function takes a function with a testing t and a string. Clean up this code. Note that this takes a string because this is what we registered as our seed corpus. If we had registered an int, this function would need to accept an int. These types need to align. Now we need to refactor the body of our test to work with the fact that we only have an input value for this test and not an actual result. In some cases, you may be able to verify the result of a function you're calling by reverse engineering the output to see if you can transform it back into the input. In this case though, we're just gonna keep things simple and see if fuzzing our code can just reveal simple errors like panics. So we will just get rid of this for now. Now, let's run this fuzz test with go test. Oops, we forgot to rename this. Call that input. There we go. Let's try again. You can see that the output looks a little different this time than it did before. And now our test cases are called seeds. It should be noted that you don't have to provide a seed corpus to your fuzz test, but if you do, these seed values will be used and run like a unit test with go test. Although we have transformed our unit test into a fuzz test, we have not actually done any fuzzing yet. To do that, we need to use a different go test command. We can additionally pass the dash fuzz flag, which takes a regular expression for which fuzz test to run. When fuzzing, the fuzzing engine will use a mutator to constantly change the seed values provided to our fuzz target. This will then create a generated corpus that is guided by code coverage to find all of the execution paths of our code being fuzzed. Let's try our, to fuzz our code and see what that all looks like. So we'll run go test dash fuzz and we'll just say dot for all targets. Yikes, it looks like we already ran into a bug. Let's take a minute and analyze this output that the fuzzing engine produced for us and see what is happening. It appears that when we are passing zero to our function, we have an error. Let's go back and check the error message we're getting. Runtime error integer divide by zero on line 27 main.go. Let's check out the code. Yep, something divided by zero is undefined. So let's see if we can fix up our code so that we never divide by zero. Let's make our app fail gracefully with a bad request status code. So we'll say if request.y is equal to zero, we'll do an error unable to divide by zero. And we'll say this is a status bad request. The great thing about when a fuzz test fails is that it records the failing result. This result is saved to the test data folder, which on future Go test runs will be used as a seed corpus and run every time as a unit test to make sure that we never have a regression for this test again. You can see that here. For this reason, it is good to check in this folder. Let's run our test again to see if that fixed it. So we'll just run a go test because that result has already been saved. And it passed. And we can see that it ran the test that was in this test data folder. Let's try to fuzz our code again to make sure there's nothing else wrong. Another panic. This time it is complaining about an invalid memory address or nil pointer dereference. Let's take a look at the data. 
string A. That does not look like JSON, so maybe there's some missing error handling going on here. Let's dive into the line of failing code. I bet that request is never initialized here because the JSON decoding failed. It appears that we forgot to check the error for the calling this function. So let's do that. We'll do a little copy and paste for decoding data this time. Great. Now let's run go test and make sure that fixed it. Hooray. Let's fuzz one last time to make sure that there is no more bugs in our code. This time, our fuzziness is taking quite a bit longer to run, so I'm going to say that it is good enough for now. You can see from the fuzz run that there are over 200 test cases that have been saved to our generated corpus, which can be found at go cache slash fuzz. In cases like these, you probably don't want to be fuzzing forever though, so you may want to make use of the fuzz time go test flag to specify how long you want your target to be fuzzed for. I hope this demo helped to show you how by spending a few minutes and adding a fuzz test to your code, you could potentially find and fix previously undiscovered bugs. Thanks to fuzzing, my little HTTP service is more reliable and more secure. If you would like to find out more about fuzzing, I would encourage you to read the post on the Go blog about it, as well as check out the Go 1.18 release notes. That's all I have for today. Thanks for spending some time with me to learn about how using Go Volncheck and or fuzzing can help improve the security of your application. See ya. Thank you.